what a wonderful world. Welcome back to See and Learn on SEBA 2012. This time we'll be covering the last two weeks of events and activities. But we'll start off our report on See and Learn with the visit of Charlotte Dromar. The evening started on a musical note provided by Scott, Luan and Jerry. Sometimes we travel right down the Green River We abandoned old prison down by Angry Hill The air smell like snakes and shoot with our pistols Empty pop bottles is all we would fill Daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County By the Green River where paradise lay Sorry, my son, but you're too late in asking Gold Charlotte Dramar, a PhD student from Guadeloupe, then explained to us about her current research project on damselfish. Small fish like uh, damselfish and blennies. So they are very small, but they are very abundant, so they can play a role, an important role for the regulation. Another expert in the marine environment is Mark Butler. He came to say about to talk about his area of expertise, the spiny lobster. So here's what the lobster guy had to say. Well, I've been studying lobsters in the Caribbean for 30 plus years and uh, never have been to Seba, so it's a wonderful opportunity to get here and really participate in a program like the See and Learn program, which is really unique you know, in a number of ways. To be able to bring scientists from around the world to come here and interact with the local population here, um, with the local school children, and to be able to um, you know, help us have a vehicle by which we scientists can bring this kind of information to the public is really unique and a real treasure that you all have here you know, in SEBA. Well, getting a chance to give a presentation, it's always a, a great opportunity for one to stand up in front of people and tell them what you do. I'm the lobster guy, so I, of course, got a chance to talk about lobsters. I, I gave people, I think, a feel for the interactions that we humans have with lobsters and what the repercussions are of those. Now, for the kids, of course, we want to make things a little more fun. And uh, it's always a challenge to uh, talk to kids at different uh, school age levels and keep them interested in science. So one of the things I really tried to get together uh, or get through to the children was how lobsters and people share something in common. One of the little girls said, when I asked, what do they share in common? She said, legs. Well, I guess that's true. We have legs as well. But the real key thing I was getting at is a behavior we have in common. That's sociality, the ability to cooperate. And spiny lobsters, unlike their clawed brethren, are, um, are social. And that has its advantages and disadvantages. And so with one of the children, what I tried to get through to them is uh, through a little activity we did was how lobsters use single file migrations when they're moving underwater to save energy, to basically like race cars to draft one another, much like birds do when they migrate in these like large Vs. And so for the children, we had them build little pinwheels and walk in either by themselves or in single file lines. And that gave them an indication of the kind of energy that they were encountering as they're moving through whether air, in the case of humans, or water, in the case of uh, lobsters. And I think the children got a great uh, experience and had a lot of fun running around the classroom and building pinwheels, but learning how lobsters and humans are similar. So having worked with lobsters in the Caribbean for such a long time, um, We've done a number of different studies over the years, some of them laboratory studies, some of them field studies. And one thing that's really, however, been the holy grail for understanding lobster biology and where lobsters go and come as larvae, where they go to and where they come from, um, probably the most important management issue is that last one, is understanding where lobsters go to and come from when they're in the larval stage. Now, many people don't realize that Lobsters, um, unlike chickens, do not just lay young who, who then hang around the parents and stay in one place. In fact, lobster larvae drift for months at a time, six to nine months in the open seas. And during that period of time, potentially can go great distances. That's a very difficult problem to get at, and it's an important management problem because we don't really know in a particular area, like, for example, Seba, whether Seba's lobsters come from Seba's lobsters or whether they come from someplace else. So to tackle this particular problem, we've um, got
gotten involved in the last few years in some modeling. This is a very sophisticated model, it actually works on a supercomputer that integrates uh, very detailed uh, depictions of currents, uh, surface currents and deep currents. It integrates the larval behavior, the larvae move up and down in the water column and that puts them in different currents. And it integrates a, a lot of information that we've had over the years. And what it's telling us, it's giving us a, a glimpse for the first time as to where these lobster larvae go to and come from. Now it's remarkable in some places we find that they really do, even after return to the same place, even after months and months in the, in, in the plankton. So in a place, for example, like the Bahamas, parts of Cuba, parts of Nicaragua, the lobsters are probably by and large coming back to those areas after traveling thousands of kilometers in the water. In other places, for example, like Ceiba, um, the lobsters are probably being, uh, as the larvae are hatched, they probably move in the currents far away, and the larvae that are coming here are coming from far away nations. And so one of the things that I wanted to do while I'm here is to talk with some of the fishermen and some of the fishery managers and start to look at these, these kinds of issues, start to consider the fact that in managing Seba's lobsters, we really need to look beyond Seba and look at some of the other nations where these lobsters might be coming from or going to. And that's really the proper way we're going to be able to, in the long term, sustain these lobsters um, for us and for our children and for our grandchildren. Geomorphologist Jennifer Ron is a longtime visitor to Seba. This year she had a very busy schedule for See and Learn. Along with her presentations to the public, she visited the schools where she showed the children about the composition of the Sabin coastline. I caught up with her during a field trip at Tent Bay and asked her the most important question. So Jennifer, where is the beach? <laughs> where is the beach? The beach is right here. This is a cobble beach. Cobbles are uh, 10 centimeters, three to 10 centimeters and larger. And so any mobile sediment along shoreline, including rocks, is technically a beach. Uh, could you explain to us what on earth you're doing here? <laughs> Um, we're measuring the, the beach and monitoring the beach profile, which is the shape of the beach as it goes from land toward shore. And as waves come up on the beach, it changes the width of the beach and the angle of the beach. And so we've developed some equipment to do that. Do you enjoy working with kids? Yeah, they're great in the field. Once, once I get them trained, once they know what they're doing, they're awesome. They, this takes me three hours alone to do, and I can do it in an hour with a group of kids. So it saves me a lot of time. And how important is it for the kids to go on field trips like these? I think it's really important that they uh, see scientists in the field, that they learn how to collect data, that they're understanding a little bit about their own island and about coastline and coastal erosion. So I, I think it's very important for the kids. We're back on Tent Reef Beach. Uh, this is after Tropical Storm Raphael, and there's significant movement of cobbles and um, sediments on this beach. As you can see from the rack line, uh, a wreck uh, hit the coast over the weekend and fell apart. And you can see by the broken wood and pieces of debris how f high up the waves moved on the beach. So further down the beach, what happened is the particles closest to the shore, the cobbles closest to the shore, got picked up in the big waves and got deposited further inshore. And we've been looking at our data that we collected today, showing that movement of the, the pre-storm profile that we took is the black line, and then the post-storm, a lot of it's disappeared further down the beach from the edge of the shore, but got deposited up on the top of the shore where we're standing now, the foreshore. And then after this was placed here during the, the shipwreck, meters more of pebbles and cobbles have covered it up and the width of the beach is now about 10 meters longer so there was a substantial amount of movement of the sediment and rocks on this beach just in the last few days from tropical storm Raphael. Local biologist and conservationist Tom van Hof has spent a long time studying the cloud forest on top of Mount Scenery. I sat down with him to talk about the prospect of conserving this unique ecosystem. I, I still I do remember when, that I um, you know when I first went up to the cloud forest it must have been the, the early 80s or so first went up there and it was virtually impenetrable it was almost impossible to take photographs there because you were always too close to everything I somehow realized that it was something special I need to go back a little because um, in the in the past I think it was the early no the late 80s or early 90s 
there was some interest from other co communication companies to build additional antenna towers on the top of the mountain. And I was very concerned. The, the Sabre Conservation Foundation was concerned about it, and the Sabre people were concerned about it as well. So we asked an expert to come here, and he basically uh, you know, explained to us that the top of the mountain and the cloud forest is you know, the, uh, so important for the hydrology of the island. It's, he called it, it's, it's the sponge that holds all the water. It's the water reservoir for all the lower areas of the, of the mountain, the lower slopes of the mountain. And um, so th 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 there are other factors that are important as well, but the hydrology, I think, is something that stands out. Um, um, so we, we were extremely grateful and we were able to, you know, through his advice and his input, to uh, stop the threat of additional antenna towers. But I think the threat is never, ha has never ended until you actually have some kind of formal protection for the cloud force. So I do think that it needs to be declared, um, you know, a formal sort of forest reserve maybe. And since it borders the, um, the, the, the park, the national park on the northern side of the island, which runs to the top of the mountain, it, it borders that. It could actually be part of that larger complex if you wanted to. That seems to me the most obvious thing. So this year is the 25th anniversary of the Seba Conservation Foundation. Could you tell us a little bit about some of their accomplishments? The establishment of the Marine Park, of course, is, uh, the, is the very first um, uh, accomplishment. Um, in fact, you know, the Marine Park came into being before the Seba Conservation Foundation, but the, um, the, the Seba Conservation Foundation was created because the, the Marine Park needed to have an organizational structure, a, a basis, and since the local government didn't want to take on the management of the park, we created an NGO, and that NGO had much broader um, um, objectives than just managing the marine park. But that is the, definitely the first accomplishment. And um, it's not just the fact that uh, we established the marine park. I think the major accomplishment is that it is a well-managed um, uh, and well-functioning marine park that has international recognition, is now also you know, recognized again as a, a national park by the Dutch government. Um, in terms of other accomplishments, um, I would say you know, another thing that stands out was the, um, um, the designation of a, uh, a national park on the north side of the island. That was the, you know, the, the famous donation of um, the, former, um, the land that was formerly owned by the Sulphur Mining Company. And, um, that that is a uh, is a very important. It, it's a small area. You know, I mean, in terms of of size, it is it's actually way too small. But then you know, on Seba scale, that doesn't really matter because Seba is small as well. Um, but um, that is important because it includes all the ecological zones from sea level to the the top of the mountain. So um, it, it harbors all of these uh, all of these zones. So it is a, is a good cross section of the of the different ecological uh, systems that you find on the island. Uh, looking into the future, uh, what more can the Seba Conservation Foundation do, together with the community, perhaps? I think, well, we talked about the top of the mountain and cloud forest before. I definitely, f I, I still feel very strongly that um, that area needs to be declared a forest reserve and, and perhaps added to the national park on the north uh, shore of the island. But um, it's also something that needs to be done um, jointly with government because it still worries me that there is no um, legislation or, or regu overall regulation that controls development on the island. Um, that is still a worrisome situation. And, um, when we started talking about you know, some uh, sort of zoning um, 10 or 12 years ago, um, that wasn't a very popular topic, and I presume it still is not a very popular topic, but it still needs to be addressed. So I think um, we have to have certain controls in place and uh, do something about land use planning in general here on the island. And of course that's not something that the Sabre Conservation Foundation can do uh, by itself, on its own, you know, we, we're talking, um, uh, we have to do with, you know, multiple landowners, private landowners here, all of these people need to be consulted, but it has to be done, has to be done sooner or later, and I think sooner rather than later.
Another important aspect of the cloud forests is the abundance of orchid species. Orchid expert Mike Bechtel came to the island to explain more. The hike today was all about going back out um, after a year, since the last time I was here, uh, to re-establish the three species that we do know are on the Sandy Cruz uh, and All Too Far Trail. We'd, and we did find them, and they were in good shape. We found the ladies' lash, Epidendrum ciliari. We found uh, Brassovola cuculata and Epidendrum anseps. All of them still in very good shape, uh, plenty of adult plants, and we found some babies on the rocks along the way. For Saba, um, back in 74, there were 10 species identified, uh, but since we started work um, in 2003, we've only found five of those 10. Um, and so those five, since then, we've found a total of 20. Um, so for the Sandy Cruz and All Too Far area, generally speaking, it's just those three. But the, the thing about Saba is it's relatively untouched and unstudied. And I'm positive that we'll find uh, many more species. We just need more scientists to come to the island uh, to help with that. So why is Seba so unique uh, in the orchid world? Well, um, over the past two years, we know that uh, orchids for the Caribbean have been designated as a sentinel species. And as a sentinel species, that generally means that they're very much um, attuned to water quality, air quality, and extremes in temperatures. Uh, so Seba, being you know, the unspoiled queen of the Caribbean, um, we know that using Seba as a research uh, location will help add to the rest of the studies that have been uh, already conducted on other islands in the Caribbean, and uh, ultimately kind of tie the whole uh, ecology of orchids together. So thank you for your contribution to See and Learn. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to come back for See and Learn. It's such an outstanding program to bring diverse scientists together to share um, their studies and, more importantly, uh, to, to bring um, the public into it to be able to share in the research and enjoy the month of See and Learn. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week for our final report on See and Learn on SEBA 2012. I think to myself, what a wonderful